One second. Okay. Uh, should be recording. It is recording. Okay. All right. So we have uh, everyone know. If everyone doesn't know Steve Crow, he is a. Uh, what I'll let you introduce yourself, Steve. Probably uh, best. Sure, you know more about yourself than I do. So go ahead, Steve. Sometimes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, a few of you, uh, I can tell, uh, know me from my time on the Homeowner uh, Leaders Council at the CAINJ, uh, as well as uh, from the Legislative Action Committee, which I serve on now, and um, on the CAI National Homeowner Leader Committee for this year. So, I've been involved in CAI for a number of years and have found it a very worthwhile organization. Um, and so what I wanted to say is, you know, right now during these challenging times where we get our information, uh, you know, from the governor's orders and from our local governments and so on, uh, our municipalities, but we also get our information like this through informal ways. And sometimes I find, uh, the informal discussions, you'll learn quite a bit, uh, from sharing ideas, uh, with other people. So I really appreciate this opportunity that we could all kind of get together uh, and, and share our ideas. So um, with that, I just wanted to open it up. This uh, session, uh, which hopefully be the first of, of many, as June said and Angela had said, uh, is that um, is the focus on safety, right? That's the biggest thing right now in our communities um, and how we go about giving guidance uh, to the residents in our communities, considering we're homeowner leaders, board members, and so on. Um, and I just wanted to relate one thing in my community and recognizing that all of our communities are different. You know, some are very large, some are smaller. Uh, you know, the demographics are different. I happen to live in uh, the Fairways Condominium Association in Livingston, New Jersey. Uh, it's 172 units. Um, the community has changed over the last uh, 10 years um, to a lot uh, younger folks with young children. And so now uh, we're facing a call for, you know, um, they're starting to get a sense that things may open up uh, and they want to use the tennis court. They want to possibly use the basketball court. They would like to have um, you know, small swimming pools for their young children, either placed on their decks or in the driveway or in the back of their units. And so we're, as a board, we understand that need, um, but we feel challenged by it. We're, you know, we're trying to, as, as, we're, as they all say, we're making this up as we go along. And so I, I just, uh, that's one of the challenges we're facing is how do you, promote safety and distancing when people are, you know, just itching to get out uh, with, you know, themselves as well as their children uh, to take advantage of the amenities that we have in our community. Uh, the same is true of we have a small gym. And it sounds like uh, once things open up, how are you going to have social distancing? How are you going to monitor that in a gym to keep everybody safe? So I put those few things out there. I don't know if anybody else is facing these type of questions yet from their residents, uh, but I open up the floor. And if you have other concerns that you want to mention, I, I, again, I think this is an opportunity for us all to learn and take some notes. So I see a shaking of the head under iPad. Uh, what's your name again? Yeah, I'll be on mute her. I'm right. sorry. My name is Maria, and I'm at the Essex and Sussex, Sussex in Spring Lake. And we also share the concern about opening the gyms. We live in a refurbished hotel that is now condominiums. There's 165 hmm. here, and it's a 55 and over. So the community being tight, the summer opening up, and we're right on the ocean, raises oh. a lot of safety. Yes. Same. Hi, I'm Deb, and uh, I was kind of curious. Do you have a point of view as to, you know, well, we can't put pools on decks necessarily, but these kiddie pools, do you have an opinion on that? Because I wasn't thinking anything about it. 
Yeah, our, our um, you know, we got a, uh, an inquiry, let me say, from a resident, and I have a feeling it won't be the last in, in our community in the coming weeks. And, you know, the three things that came up were, again, the, the driveway, the, the behind our units, which is a little bit of green space, but we're concerned because certain areas are already waterlogged as it is, and we're afraid that will just add to it because we would request that the pool be emptied at the end of the day. And putting it on the deck is interesting. Some board members feel that's the best place. I'm concerned whether there's a liability issue if the board says, yeah, go ahead, put a kiddie pool on your deck and a child or an adult slips out of the pool or onto the deck and hits their head. And, you know, so I'm always looking at sort of the risk averse uh, so my, my opinion is that I would prefer it not on the deck. Uh, we haven't sought legal counsel yet on that, but I'm concerned about the liability. It, it, for me, I would prefer it behind the units where there's grass and you just empty it. And if yes, if we have some additional landscaping costs because grass gets damaged or wetter, then, then so be it. Um, the other thing I might add is that we do have a basketball court, but we've closed that naturally uh, a month or two ago, and we've allowed people to put up hoops in their driveways for their kids, of which the residents have been very appreciative. So um, it's a balancing act that you know, re really is. Yeah. What's that? It, th how about their neighbors? Because usually what you're satisfying on one side, uh, yeah, there are others that will complain as well. Uh, uh, agreed. You know, yeah. when you talked about We haven't gotten a lot of uh, yeah. pushback yet. Yeah, we haven't gotten a lot of pushback yet, but I'll have to say sometimes when I'm taking my mid-afternoon siesta, I'm not too pleased. So, <laughs> um, but yeah. Anybody else well, would like to in share? In our complex, we have Charlie, 300. Got some? Oops. Go ahead. Who's talking? I'll mute yourself. I don't know. Um, I was just saying that we have a 300. And... Go ahead, Jen. I... You. Okay, I'm sorry. Listen. So in our complex, we have 366 units, a combination of townhome, townplex, and condo. And what I have noticed is there are people that are using the back of units as well as driveways for their six foot social distancing. And, you know, it's kind of refreshing so that people are recognizing the severity and taking precaution. And at the same time, there are those that aren't six feet. So I, I'm not going to be the police person to do that, you know, to go around, mm -hmm. but how, we, what are the things that you are putting in place or that you're seeing could work? trying to reinforce this social distancing and because our pool is supposed to open at some time this year as well. And I'm kind of curious as to how we're going to do that around the pool. Cheryl? Cheryl, do you want to speak to that? Yourself, Hold on, let me unmute her. Hold on, it's not on Go ahead. Cheryl? I need to unmute and unmute myself I because, of the, because of the dog. Um, uh. oh. um, I lost my train of thought now. We, and John Riley, please chime in since we're on the board in the same association. We've had many, many talks about reopening the facilities and people, social distancing. Um, John had mentioned I can't remember if it was in our meeting yesterday or this morning that he's seen people bring their chairs out in their driveways and talk to their neighbors so it's safe six feet apart. Uh, we have opened our pool, but not to people. Uh, and the things that we're talking about are things you can hear on 101 webinars from American Pool and, and Candlewood about you need 36 square feet of space for each person. Um, we're not putting out our pool furniture. 
if we do open up the pool at all, it will have to be monitored with people's furniture and how we're going to sanitize anything that gets touched. Uh, the lifeguard cannot be the policeman there. That's, that's not his job. We're also talking about how to open up the fitness center, which we lost to a flood in October and we're ready to reopen, what was it, March? John, I think. And we were like two days away from opening it when we got the stay at home order. <laughs> so we have a bunch of brand new equipment in there that hasn't been used. We're talking about various things, having a monitor in there, uh, booking time to go to the gym, but it's got to be, it's got to be overseen. We're not thinking yet about opening the entire clubhouse. So we're working on ways to be able to access the restrooms from the gym without getting into the rest of the clubhouse. And we have an exterior door to the gym that so that you don't have to come inside the building and through the lobby uh, so that we can just keep people out of the building in general. Those are some of the things we're talking about and some of the measures that we're talking about using. We also, uh, to chime in, we also just today started talking about, because uh, we had a, a virtual coffee break with about 25 of our residents, went over pretty well much as this meeting was on Zoom. And one of the questions that came up there was, well, what about the tennis courts? And what about the bocce courts? And, why can't we play bocce mm -hmm. if I bring my own set of bocce equipment and so on and so on. And right. it's like, yeah, we get all that right now, unless and until governor Murphy relaxes some of his language around stay at home. I'm going to lean on that. I'm going to say, no, stay home. Once he decides to you know, set it up. So we have a park about a mile away from us. If the township says, okay, we're going to open up our bocce courts. We can take that as a direction that will help guide us. It won't be the only guiding thing. Right. We, I, Steve, I, I was smiling when you said, uh, in a sense, words that I've said before that I get known as Mr. Liability here. And it's like, folks, as the president, I got to worry about that stuff because I've been on the wrong end of it. We lost our insurance. My insurance rates doubled. So mm -hmm. if you don't watch out for liability, you're going to pay. So that's why we watch about it. One of the things that we did look at just this morning was maybe we're, we'll buy some portable outdoor sinks and put them by the bocce court, put them mm. by the tennis court. Mm. So people have a place to wash that they don't have to come in the building to do it. So, you know, all these are, are accommodations to living in a post COVID world. Yeah. Um, and we don't know when the real normal is going to return. And I'm not to scare anybody probably has, if ever, um, you know, we, we talked this morning with uh, someone who said they brought up, I think Charlotte was you, that brought up um, the, po no, it was somebody else who brought up the polio uh, crisis that happened early in the, 20, the 20th century. It took five years before people got comfortable about socializing, five years, because that's when the salt vaccine came out. We don't know what COVID. And, and I think someone said here, you know, hey, we're, we're, it's all unprecedented. It is. And I think every one of us who's on a board is saying, boy, did I pick the wrong year to be on the board? Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> right? uh, so, you know, we'll, we're, we're doing the best that we can. I think it's always better to err on the side of caution. Um, and you know, The I'm one thing that I... Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Steve. The one, the one thing that I, just to step back to your tennis court uh, point, and, and we have our one tennis court here, but what's, what I'm finding, um, we're finding challenging is that different towns are starting to open up their tennis courts. Right. So then, of course, our residents uh, know that um, because everything's online. You can easily find out what has happened. Um, and then they're pressing us to say, well, if they've done it, why can't we do it? Um, why can't we come up with something? And, you know, uh, every sport has an organization. The tennis world has the United States Tennis Association, which provides 
guidelines. They have published them. Um, and I've read them. Uh, there's a lot of good guidance in there, but uh, I don't think it's, um, I try to defer to the health officials in, in this instance about uh, what could be infectious when you play the game of tennis. And I don't want to get into all the subtleties and the nuances of that, but it is challenging uh, to have to try to explain that to residents when they see other towns opening up because Governor Murphy opened up the county parks, even though tennis was not permitted, I think it's gonna be coming soon. And that's why these other towns also opened up their tennis courts. Right. And now private you know, communities like ours are gonna be faced with the same thing. And how do you protect everybody from that? Well, we not, not an easy thing. No, it's not. We, we're fortunate in one other respect is that we can get um, somewhat of an early warning on what our township's going to do, Franklin Township, mm -hmm. because one of our residents is a town council member. So we mm -hmm. kind of have a, a little bit of a, and actually one of my board members is also on the planning board. So it helps a lot that we, mm -hmm. that we actually so leverage that. Uh, the zoning board, sorry, zoning I keep saying board. Planning, the zoning board. So it, we leverage that connection to just look, we're not asking for stuff you shouldn't tell, but if you can tell us, tell us. So we're, we've got as much warning as possible so we can deal with it because you're, you're absolutely right. It's, you know, and the governor had, when he opened the parks, he banned, you know, contact sports. I don't think in anybody's mind, tennis is a contact sport. Right. Um, as it's played in our community, it's not really even an action sport because they sort of just stand there and let the ball go by. Um, right. 55 and older. I don't have to run. I gave up running years ago. So, yeah. it, but the, the challenge that we have is just will people, you know, we had some challenges early on when they first started with the, you know, go out at seven o'clock at night and clap your hands. A group of residents decided to start a ground, ground roots effort. Let's go stand by the, the pond and everybody do it together. And we're like, please. We can't order you not to. We can simply beg right. you, and we're begging you, don't do that. Please, right. we're begging you not to do that because it's just not a smart thing to do. And so Deb, that's, that's really the position we have to have had to take. I understand. So Deb. I'm on the border of New York, uh, Rockland County, and uh, I know Cuomo has been speaking about the four phase entry and tennis is on that phase one. So mm -hmm. I know it's only a matter of time when we're getting into that same vein of um, the virus, I guess, pattern. Um, so I can only think that that will happen soon. Yes. Rose? Chester in Ocean County. And we seem to be going through the exact same thing. Al is on the board, I'm chair of finance. But we have a lot of people talking about the pool. We have a lot of people talking about tennis courts. There was an article that says that Governor Murphy left it up to the mayors to decide about opening tennis courts. But the people who are doing it are saying that you can only play singles and you have to leave a court next to you on each side. So if you have right. to have four, you would only use two of them. You cannot use right. it for pickleball, which is another thing that our group would like opened up. As far as our pool, we are planning to have it service the outdoor pool in order to use it, but we need to have a health inspection and the township has not um, given any date of when they're going to do that. So the outdoor pool obviously can't be done until the health inspection is done. The indoor pool is still closed and we have not opened up anything as yet, but there is a lot of clamoring. We are strictly 55 and older, so we don't have the children part of it, mm -hmm. but we do have... Um, the fitness center and how do you keep it clean? Mm -hmm. um, do you hire people for the outdoor pool to monitor it? Do you hire somebody right. else mm -hmm. for the fitness center to monitor it? So there's a lot of people are saying we should be reducing their HOA fees. Well, we're going to have a lot of extra through the rest of the year for all of these extras that need to be done in order to open up each separate section. So we were just wondering how other people are dealing with those types of issues. The there's uh, the other question I have, and our community is River Point, and we're about 500 homes, uh, all single family, 55 and older. 
Um, from a liability standpoint, what are the rest of you thinking as far as is the HOA liable in any way? God forbid somebody in the community comes down with the coronavirus and says it's because they were playing tennis or using the gym. Um, our advice from our property manager and attorney feels that there is not much liability regarding coronavirus uh, for the HOA. And I was curious what the rest of you, what guidance you've gotten from your attorneys uh, concerning that issue. Cheryl, go ahead. Go Thank ahead, Cheryl. You. Thank you, Angela. Um, I want to piggyback on, on stuff that John had said after I spoke the last time. But I, if I recall correctly, um, our attorney said, we would not bear any responsibility based on the actions that we have taken, which are all documented. A um, couple of the things that we do to get ahead of people asking questions about the sports courts, as we call them, uh, is to let people know what is going on before they ask. We have a lot of communication um, with the community residents under John's great tutelage. We also defer to the, the governor and the township on those decisions. I have not heard, Rose, of, of and have not read of anything about tennis courts like you were referring to. Right. Um, but the other thing that we have is something John developed, which I've shared with Roz and with Angela, is our DEFCON chart. John, do you want to talk about that? Hold on, let me unmute him. Hold on. Well, go ahead, John. Yep. Uh, yeah, for those of us who can remember a movie called War Games from back in the <laughs> whenever. Um, yes. yes, I stole the chart, uh, the basis of the chart from, from War Games. It only has four. I probably should have used five because it looks like we made it a fifth one. But we're just calling it a defense condition. And right now for us, DEFCON 4 is everything's open, you know, just like it was, all the way down to DEFCON 1, which is everything's closed. So the intermediate ones were related to, okay, we're going to cancel all the activities, but we're going to leave the building open. That we were in that for a little bit before the stay at home order. When the stay at home order came out, we said, Actually, before the state home order, we went to DEVCON 2, which was, okay, no more activities of any kind, no card playing, no poker, no mahjong, nothing. The building is closed to everybody but the office staff and uh, the board members and other key operators, if you will. And then we went to DEVCON 1 when Governor Murphy said stay at home, and that we sent the office staff to work from home in conjunction with our management company. And so we've been at DEVCON 1 since the stay-at-home policy came out. We intend to reverse the steps, much as Governor Cuomo and Governor Murphy. So we'll go from DEVCON 1 back to DEVCON 2. And then we may stay at DEVCON 2 for, for an appreciable amount of time. Then we'll go to DEVCON 3. I wish I could say I felt like we'd, we'd be at DEVCON 4 sometime in 2020, but I don't see it. I really don't see it. Um, agree with you on that you know it just i wish i could uh and ironically we had already decided long before we ever heard of covid we had decided this year not to have a new year's eve party so at least we're not on the hook for that one they already know we had already announced no year, no new year's eve party because it was so not well attended last year so, so it's a challenge go ahead so, go ahead gene hold gene. on let me, hold on let me unmute you go ahead <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everybody. Rose, I'm down here with you. I'm in Renaissance. Um, one of right. my great concerns with the town's opening and the county's opening is the fact that we are the vulnerable populations and they're not addressing right. us specifically. The one thing uh, that I found in the CDC guidance says that they're relating it to vulnerable workers. Well, if you say a vulnerable worker with a job is the same as a vulnerable person going into all of our facilities. 
Vulnerable workers include individuals over 65 with an underlying medical condition, such as asthma, lung disease, severe asthma, heart conditions, weakened immunity, obesity, diabetes, liver disease, kidney disease. And it says further down, establish and continue communications. And you can only reopen if you can ensure strict social distancing, proper cleaning and disinfecting. Initially, we are considering, we have a 20 page document on reopening. We are considering only opening some outdoor activities. And I think bocce and tennis are the most problematic. If any of you ever watched that, that woman on, on Facebook showing how you touch things and it communicates the disease, it's the tennis ball that's the problem. It's the bocce ball that's the problem. So we're not, we're not to tennis and bocce yet, but I do think we have to be a lot more concerned in terms of our vulnerable populations. While I agree, because I even heard they're going to have, uh, they're talking about a federal law uh, that people can't sue over the coronavirus. But I think mm -hmm. if we do everything properly, that uh, our, our liability will be limited. Exactly. Deb? Hold on, go ahead. Um, so I have to ask, is that an old definition of vulnerable? Because with the new uh, discoveries, I would say we are all vulnerable. There is no age requirement because you have children now who are dying with this right. disease. So um, I think that we have to handle everyone as being subject to vulnerability. Fair enough. Yes, yes Jean? Go ahead, Jean. This is the CDC guidelines that came out last week. I got them from Johns Hopkins University. So it might be a little aged under the circumstances because of the new stuff that's surfacing, especially okay. with kids. I, I had yes. a question. When people are walking through your community now, and you know, my community is has flipped. It's it's a much younger community than when I first got here with a lot of children. But what I'm noticing is people within six feet of each other chatting away, no masks. And, you know, the, as a board member, you know, I bite my tongue and, and I've discussed it with other board members. Is it our role to, as, you know, we were talking earlier about communicating um, and reminding people and some board members are, you know, uh, the governor speaks and everybody knows what the regulations and rules are about social distancing and mitigation. But I walk through my community and it scares the living daylight out of me. Uh, because, and you know, naturally all of us just get on the news and see restaurants opening up and, and it seems to be like still a cavalier app attitude, even though there's been so much pain and, and sadness in our state. So I'm, I'm a little baffled as a board member how to, how to deal with that. I'll, I'll talk to that one because we okay. uh, had a Zoom board meeting Tuesday on the same issue. Now okay. we put out we put out weekly video of our property manager driving around the community. Then we put out two emails a week advising people about things that, that are inappropriate. We have said if you are walking alone or with your significant other, you don't need to be wearing a mask, but you need to carry a mask right. so that if you come upon every, anyone, you need to put the mask on. We have not had, well, for one thing, we are, we are a lot of vulnerable people. We don't have tons and tons of people out walking. Mm -hmm. no, that's, that's good, but you're, you're communicating on a frequent basis. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I subscribe to that. I think it's very important. Thank you. John? So, oh. Sorry. Yeah, um, we share the same concerns. We do have quite a lot of people out walking and we have uh, advertised it as well. And, and we also include in our advertisement, we had, a, and we, had a, we had 25 people on a virtual coffee break today and I told them again to, to remind people, what is the mask for? The mask isn't for you. Right. The mask is for the other people. So right. take a little bit of consideration for the people you're meeting and they'll take hopefully the same consideration for you, but uh, the same thing, please take your mask with you, even if you're walking with your significant other, because it is to prevent the spread. Not, uh, yes, oh yeah, I don't have it. Well, 
as we've talked about, all the early guidance is gone, right? It's changed. It's different. Right. Right. You can be asymptomatic and still spread it. Yeah. So you don't know. You can't say, oh, I don't have it. We were nice enough. And it's going to sound weird, but we were nice enough to have one of our residents tell the board he had it. He had it. Mm -hmm. He self-quarantined. Mm -hmm. He went. He got tested. His wife got tested. We said to him, thank you for telling us. We appreciate that. We would like to, to inform the community that someone had it, but we will not tell them who. Right. And he said, thank you very much. I, would, I, I have no problem with them with, as long as you don't mention my name. So right. that's the other thing. We don't. We felt it ob an obligation to let the community know because, again, guys, if you think it's not here, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It is. We, we, have, ahead, had, we have had six deaths uh, in our community. Oh, and, wow. Uh, the word spreads. Okay. We, the, board, the board has a reporting mechanism that that's, doesn't even come to board members. It goes to the management company. But um, people are very aware. That's why when I said we don't have a lot of people walking around, it's, right. it's because we had because some people die early on. I don't Go know. ahead, Deb. Now, I was going to say that I'm one of those people that I will actually comment to people. It's maybe not a popular thing to do. And it's more a matter of just explaining that it is for the protection, not only of them, but mostly for other people. Um, I have been lucky enough because I do a lot of walking mm -hmm. and I walk by myself. Do I carry my, my mask? I absolutely do because I would like to have the flexibility of going in and getting a coffee if I want one. <laughs> right. But, you know, the look of horror on people's faces, I think you have those that are very, very cognizant and sensitive to it. And then you have those, to your point, who are very cavalier and, you know, figure it's their right. I don't know what right you have to challenge somebody else's life, but you know, I think it's it's very interesting what I'm seeing surface in government and it surfaces all over and just people just carry a banner, which doesn't make any logical sense to me. All right. Uh, we haven't heard from some folks. If anybody who hasn't spoken would like to, um, Vanessa, Paul, Richard, uh, Howard, sure, go ahead. Hold on, hold on, Howard. One second. Very slow. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Just um, just talking about the social distancing. Um, mm -hmm. I know a lot of the people on the phone are in like 55 and over communities. I actually am not. So this weekend we had an incident where the actual police came into the development. Mm -hmm. um, people were not social distancing, but it really wasn't the people. It was their kids playing. Mm -hmm. Somebody called. The cops came into the development, spoke to the parents, but from a legal enforcement standpoint, there was nothing the police could do. They can't do anything. Right. They couldn't do anything legally. So, but the parents were very cooperative. They backed their kids up. I'm sure they spoke to them prior about the social distancing, but it was, it was just very interesting to see the police in the development over this. I just want to know if anybody who, um, who lives in a community that's not 55 and older, who have children had any experiences with this in the past? Deb? We actually have cops in our neighborhood, which is kind of fascinating. And they're the ones that had the congregation in their um, driveway. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> oh, the cops? <laughs> Six foot, six foot, well, it was his wife, but that's not the point. The point <laughs> is that they are recognizing it. And quite honestly, he said, there was a virus that went through his family in February. So it's very likely it could have been COVID um, because of what happened. And we didn't know anything to know better. But um, we, have, we have kids in the neighborhood. We have a lot of age differences. I've seen, um, I haven't seen a lot of kids on the street or playing, interesting enough. Um, so it's the, I have seen teenagers, I have seen college kids. They seem to be congregating in parking lots, six foot different distances or out of the sunroofs of their vehicles, which is very refreshing. I'm seeing more, um, more of them being more steadfast than I am seeing of some older people that would know but, or should know better. But do they, do they wear masks then? Uh, when they're six foot apart, I'm not seeing that in the, in the but you know, if they're congregating in a high school parking lot, I'm commending them for really taking that 
and, and keeping the distance. And there was a cop that drove by because we are having mm -hmm. people, the cops patrolling all the time. And I think they were even commending these kids for doing the same thing. I took a picture and posted on Facebook. I thought it was commendable, mm -hmm. honestly. Vanessa? Hold on one second, Vanessa. Hold on. Go ahead. Okay. I live in a development in uh, Regency. Vanessa, we, a little, talk a little louder. We can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you that's hear me? Better. Is this better? Yeah, that's, yeah, better. that's better. Yeah. Okay. I live in Regency Homes in Quail Brook. Um, it is not a 55 and over community. My husband and I walk every day, um, and we do see people walking with and without masks. We don't wear our masks unless we run into somebody that we want to talk to, um, but we have them with us. Right. I see people with and without masks, but what I am seeing that's interesting is people are very willing to, we walk outside the development, mm -hmm. and people are very willing to step into the roadway to go yes. around each other. So we never really, which is really, it, it's very nice to see that people are aware. Mm -hmm. So you never, you see people coming towards you, it becomes like a game, who's gonna go in the street and who's gonna stay on the sidewalk. You know, we always wave and laugh as we walk past. Right. Um, you know, or cross the street or something like that. But I haven't, I've seen families out walking with each other. And since the guidance says, if you live in the same household, there's no reason to wear a mask. You can walk together and not wear a mask. So we see a lot of that. I see, I'm speaking to everything I'm hearing, I think. Mm -hmm. So I'm, see, I'm seeing um, children playing. We have uh, two families whose children play together. They don't wear masks. We see other kids that have masks on. Um, that are riding their bikes, et cetera. So we're seeing a little mixed bag of everything. I haven't seen the police in the community yet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I wanted to raise the point that we have a couple of board members who um, believe we should be opening the tennis court in the tot lot. We only have a tennis court and a small tot lot next to, um, next to, each, next to each other. Sorry, I was hearing something. Um, and the small, the tot lot is, is relatively small there. You couldn't really do any social distancing in there unless you stood across the street. Like um, and the tennis courts have, have been closed and there's been kind of a disagreement as to whether or not the tennis courts and tot lot should be open. The argument being from one of the board members that people need something to do. Um, I am, I personally disagree with that. I mean, I know people, yes, people need something to do. I think people need to find things to do. I don't think we should be opening the tot lot or the, the tennis courts until the, the state does, until the governor says, uh, and the, and the uh, medical experts say that it's safe to do so. I just want to know what your feedback was on that. I came in late. I apologize for being late, guys. I'm no, working. no worries. But I, I wanted to hear what you guys had to say about that. Deb? So honestly, I think with what's surfacing now with the kids and the extreme issues that they're having, we're going to have a lot of parents that are going to be very concerned about even going to the tot lot. Um, so I don't know that the pressure is going to be there, but I have already heard questioning with regard to tennis courts. I, I liked what I heard about singles. I liked what I heard about not having the, you know, having courts on either side open. Um, in our case, we only have two and one can be used as a pickleball court. So maybe it's just one group at a time. Right. Um, the just concern so. I would have also is that it becomes a congregation area because we've had kids hanging out in the courts and mm -hmm. using it as their social yep. you know, grouping. Mm -hmm. um, so right. I have a concern about it. I don't know oh, how we that's would true. police it or, I mean, honestly, I think people have to be accountable and they have to be mature and adult-like mm -hmm. um i don't want to be the police person i really right. don't and you know, unfortunately at, uh, we would suffer consequences as a result if i could just right, respond to you um uh, i we had put up police tape the caution tape right um, around the top lot and everything and people have gone through it broke it wow. and, and oh, they're, they're actually going in the top lot and uh, one of my board members has also said that they've seen people on the tennis courts, even though we have the, the gate locked and the whole bit. So I, you know, they're over there. With I still don't think it's a good idea to let them, to have them open. I don't know. I would agree with you. With regard to the tennis courts, I would 
suggest you go to the United States Tennis Association site and just look at their guidelines. They put out two. One is for clubs, essentially, and one is for players. Uh, and of note is, you know, each player should use their own separate can of balls, mm -hmm. uh, tennis balls. They should not handle them. The other persons, the other players, uh, they shouldn't pick it up from the ground. They should lift it with their racket and then hit it back. Mm -hmm. So the idea would be that you would not be touching or handling um, the other players' tennis balls. I find it kind of an impractical way to do this. I don't know how many people can do that. <laughs> um, you know, even I'm fairly coordinated and I don't think I can do it. So, uh, but look, you know, they're trying to pay attention. It's also the question is, if you hit the ball, how far, if that ball had virus on it, would it trajectory out, you know, yeah. its trajectory? So, you know, it's, it really gets difficult when you analyze all the points of failure that could happen here, and it can drive you nuts. It can literally drive you nuts, but that's what I would suggest. Look at them. Doesn't mean you have to accept them, but they do provide some guidance as to how it might work, as, as Deb suggested. You play singles, no doubles. Um, I'm assuming in that scenario, there's no masks. Uh, and as, as I think uh, Rose suggests, you know, said that it's every other court between, you know, you don't have adjacent courts uh, where players are near each other, so. What do you guys um, think about signage though? And, and by the way, I was at a, I did a C, I was attending a CAI webinar, attending, sitting here attending a CAI webinar. And um, <laughs> they talked about um, the fact that um, you're not really protected from liability, even if you put up signage. We were talking about putting up a sign saying, you know, at your own, we could open it and say, you know, you play at your oh, own at risk. Oh, at your own risk. Yes, please be aware of COVID-19, yada, 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 and you play at your own risk. Um, but they're saying, the, the, some of the attorneys in the room were saying that, no, it, you're really, that doesn't protect you, really. If somebody's going to sue, they're going to sue. They, may, right. they will probably lose, but you will have to, you know, have, have representation to defend your position. Got it. So that sort of left me with, what do you do? All right. Roz, you want to say something? Hold it. Um, where is she? Hold on, Roz. Okay. I, you know, I just want to tell everyone uh, before Roz speaks up, we are just about 10 minutes left. So I want to make sure that if, if anyone hasn't had a chance to participate, right, Steve? Because I'm going yep. to try to get the one hour. Go All ahead, right. Roz. Okay, we have a lot of card players, and they're, of course, anxious to get back to playing cards. Some people are playing in their homes. We are not happy about it, but we're not policemen. But pe if people don't want to understand, they're not going to understand. Anyhow, what are we going to do if and when we can open our clubhouse with the card players? Anybody have any ideas? Go ahead, Sandy. Hold on. Who's, who's, who wants? Who? Sandy Katz. Sandy Katz. Wait, raise your hand. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Go ahead. You're unmuted. Roz, hi, Roz. Um, one thing I want to say from before talking about policing, I don't think that the board members should be policing. Um, you can't get in any arguments with anybody, uh, and it just might happen if you tell them they should have on a mask, uh, and then your liability. Uh, you're not going to be covered over under a DNO insurance uh, if you get in a fight uh, over something like that. So board members shouldn't be policing out there. You put out the word whatever way that you do. Um, and Roz, on the uh, card games, when the time comes that we do open our, um, our clubhouse, one of the last things going to be open for cards and mahjong. I mean, everybody's on top of each other. You're touching the mahjong tiles. You're touching the cards. So that's one of the last things we're worrying about. You know, we did open our golf course uh, last week or so. Um, and we're looking at the tennis rules. Some of those rules, I'm sure if anybody looked at them, and, and uh, Steve just mentioned, no, most of our players, they're not going to start with the take the racket and lift up the ball and whose ball is it. It isn't. Uh, but we're getting, we are looking to, to be ready. Uh, also, we're looking, uh, you know, of course, what the governor says, what the town says. Uh, and, you know, we're in Monroe. Uh, senior development. We have a 2026 units. Um, so we do have a lot of people. Uh, we're concerned uh, when the clubhouse does open, uh, maybe, you know, maybe just one entrance. 
one entrance in. Um, maybe where we had some uh, guards at the pool monitoring, maybe we have some guards. We haven't decided yet if we're going to do temperatures or not or have uh, a, a liability, have them sign off sheets or that we haven't decided yet. But when we do get open, the cards in Mahjong are, are sure as heck not uh, going to be on top of the list. Um, thought I'd mention that. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Cheryl? Uh, I think early on, correct me if I'm wrong, John, we, we did have one person say, I'm going to use the tennis court no matter what you say, but I think it's padlock now. We have signs by all the sports courts that things are closed, but we've taken it one step further mm. for contractors, and I'm going to let John explain that. Yeah, all we did, on, again, from a liability perspective on the contractors is we crafted a little document, ran it through our legal. They said, yeah, go for it. And we are, we asked all the contractors that we do business with that if they're coming on site, that they agree by, to these rules, if you want to call them that, that they are responsible for providing the equipment and the guidelines to their employees mm -hmm. about social distancing and wearing masks mm -hmm. and where also saying that it's our expectation that they will have the policies in place that if one of their employees thinks they have COVID, they can report it without fear of losing their job. Because no offense, but you know, a lot of landscape companies, a lot of companies are, are employing people who would be afraid to come forward necessarily if, if they, they thought they might lose their job. We sent it out to 16 contractors of over half, that was a week ago, over half have already returned it. We countersign it. It has some expectations that they should they have of us, such as are anyone you know management company or board members who interact with their employees will be wearing uh, personal protective equipment. So that again, there's a two, trying to make a two way street out of it. It got very good. As a matter of fact, we had one contractor say, you know, I never thought about that thing about a company policy. I'm going to put that out right now. Mm -hmm. I want my people to know they should not fear anything. It's better to tell me you have COVID so we can deal with it. You won't lose your job. So. Got it. Charlie? <laughs> Hold on, Charles. Hold on. Yeah, I'm throwing, Go ahead, Charles. I'm throwing out something uh, a little bit different. It concerns uh, board meetings and open meetings. And are you uh, doing a Zoom meeting uh, to involve the community or are you? running your board meetings uh, basically close to the community over the telephone uh, because my <clears throat> here is doing that. Um, there's no Zoom. Um, it, it's done out of people's houses over the telephone. Um, and uh, there's, there's growing concern. What are other places doing? Are you... Uh, are you, up? are you open to the community or are you hiding? Paul, did you want to say something? To them. So who was who who was speaking up? Raise your hand. Paul? <laughs> hold it. Hold on, hold on that, hold that thought. It's not unmuting. Unmute yourself. There you go. There you go. go ahead, Paul. Uh I, I just thought that 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 uh insurance or the uh, contract thing that John suggested. Maybe he would send it to you and you could send it to all of us. I think that's a great idea. Okay. Sounds like a good idea. You forward that to me. Sandy? Yeah, on board, on uh, board meetings, uh, the, on the monthly meetings, uh, you know, we have a TV station. So we had, uh, you know, the board had our Zoom meeting, uh, which was recorded. And that night and many other times it's, uh, it's shown uh, on, our, on our channel local ch our channel for the uh, community. But um, a week ahead of time, we put out emails and let everybody know anybody had any questions to send in, uh, email in any questions that they had. Uh, and also there was a box, they could have left the questions outside the building. And we went through the questions and every single one of the questions was answered by one of the board members. Um, you know, we have to readjourn a meeting and our regular meetings, we open, have a, an open ask anything you want kind of question. So we did that. And we're going to do that again. We meet the fourth Wednesday. So next week, we'll send out another note. If you have any questions, we're happy to answer what the heck's going on. And our, uh, on our Channel 26 uh, viewing, it's, it's on um, a couple times a day. It's on for a week or two so they can see what's going on. Rose? 
Uh, yes, uh, what we're going to be doing is on June 1st, we're attempting our first Zoom meeting. We have not mm -hmm. had it. We did last month in April have our elections. We changed our bylaws a while ago that enabled us to do it by electronically. Right. So we were able to have our elections, which worked very well. Uh, it did not interfere with any of the other things that we needed. We did not have to do an in-person uh, or put off the election. So we were able to do that. The Zoom meeting, we don't know. We're hoping for the best. We'll see what happens. Yeah, uh, this is Al. Uh, for the first time, we're trying a Zoom meeting uh, on June 1st with the entire community and being invited to the meeting. Uh, similar to what someone else just said, um, we're going to be soliciting questions a week in advance of having the meeting so that we can get an idea of what the residents would like answered and we will try and answer as many of those questions as we can. Um, it's an experiment. We typically do a meeting with the community every two months. We haven't had one since January. So this is our first attempt at a community meeting. Uh, we have been meeting uh, our work session meetings uh, basically twice a month and that's been going extremely well. Uh, we've had no issues with that. So uh, we'll let you know the next time the group gets together how a uh, meeting with we're anticipating probably 300 households attending the meeting okay. and see how that goes. Okay, John. Hold on. Yeah, I, yep, I got it. Um, we had it uh, in March. We had a, not a Zoom meeting, we had a Zoom webinar, which is a different kind of Zoom meeting. A webinar means you can have panelists that everybody sees, but attendees come in audio only. So it ran mm -hmm. very much like a regular open board meeting where mm -hmm. they could ask their questions interactively, they could do it mm -hmm. through chat. There actually is a Q&A panel that you don't see on a regular meeting, but you do in a webinar. And we had somebody monitoring both of those you can answer directly in the Q&A panel. You can type it in or you can say, no, we responded to that. So it is an extra cost. We mm -hmm. thought it was worth the investment. We actually had 60 plus people attend, which is far more than have ever attended an open board meeting unless there was some issue that they wanted to rake us over the coals on. Mm -hmm. um, we also had a, a fair number of our snowbirds attend the meeting. And we've gotten a lot of positive feedback to the extent that they're asking, hey, once we can get back to having live meetings, would you guys consider still having this um, as a way for us to come in and stay involved in the community when we're not there? So I highly recommend it. I thought it went extremely well. Yeah, Cheryl good. can echo in, but uh, the other recommendation Mark? I would have is if you're going to do it, uh, let me, if you're going to do it, yeah. absolutely put together a PowerPoint. I know people hate it, but it keeps the meeting under control. Trust me, it does. Interesting. Um, yeah, Mark? it went, it, it went yeah, really well because it also um, allowed people who don't normally want to go out at night or if it's bad weather or for any reason, they could still participate right. in the meeting right. and not have to leave their house and go somewhere. No, that's a good point. Mark, did you have something? Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, thank you. I wanted to listen in on you guys. Um, come on up to Hamilton. It's beautiful up here. Uh, I see a palm tree <laughs> back there. What is that? <laughs> Vanessa, did you have one last point you want to make? Yeah, yeah I just wanted to, to uh, the electronic um, voting. We, we talked about that at our first Zoom meeting Monday night, which was just the board members. But we have a, a, an election coming up um scheduled for july but we're thinking about postponing it how did your electronic who did you you had to use a third party for your electronic voting yes we did Rose? we used vote vote hoa hoa vote hoa i believe am i on vote hoa we can hear yes yes you yes. are thanks and thanks so Rose. Know. Yes. Right in house. yes and you have to check your check your uh, bylaws and your declaration to make sure you're allowed to do that. We had to actually have our bylaws changed. We're in the process of, right. we're in the process of that right now. Thank you. Okay. Right. Uh, before we go, I just want to thank, I, we have two board members, see board members on, on the call. I need to do some Charles Levine. Raise your hand, Charles. And Vanessa Davenport. Thank you both for joining today. And thank you everyone.
Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. This was really, this was really great. I think we can learn a lot from each other. Just sharing and, and uh, learning, uh, you know, under these kind of forums is really worthwhile. It is. Yes, it is. I'm very good. Thank you. I agree. Good. Thank I you. I agree. I great job, this. Steve. I will be sending out a survey. Uh, if you can all complete the survey and uh, put any suggestions for future topics, I'm going to try to do this once a month. And yes, thank you, Steve. You did a great job. Thank you very much thank for you. leading this. My pleasure. Thank yes, you everyone. did, Steve. Good. Hey, Angela, how many were on? I'm, I'm curious. How many people were on? 25. Very good. Yeah, okay, it's very good. Good, good job. Take care. Okay, Bye. everybody, take care. Everybody, be, be safe. Thank be safe. You. Thank you. Safe. Thank you. Safe. Right. Great week. I would just Thanks. like to, to thank Steve and Angela for finally putting this together because this is something that those of us who have been on the HL uh, committee, the homeowner leader committee in New Jersey, um, we've been trying to put something together, mm -hmm. wasn't on Zoom, but similar, this works better for at least three, the three years that I've been on the committee. Yeah. So thank you. It's I hope we see more of this going forward. <laughs> we will. All right. Stay All right. safe, everybody. everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.